a shadow in the Emerald Kingdom. Imagine London, the winter of 1940, a city holding its breath. The air is thick and tense, heavy with the anticipation of bombing raids. Air raid sirens wail so often their sound becomes the soundtrack of daily life. People peer into the leaden sky, squinting at the flashes of anti-aircraft shells, listening for the growing roar of Heinkel and Junker's engines. But among them, there was one. That was different. It appeared suddenly, without a roar, without warning. It was a ghost. High, high up, at an altitude where the blue sky turns almost black, where the sun shines blindingly, and the stars feel close enough to touch. At an altitude of 12,000 meters, that's higher than modern passenger airliners fly. For that time, it was an unimaginable, almost science fiction height. The border between the world of humans and the domain of the gods. Ground observers, if they managed to spot it, saw only a tiny, silvery dragonfly, slowly and majestically floating in the crystal clarity of the stratosphere. Anti-aircraft guns fired helplessly in its direction, their shells bursting kilometers short leaving pathetic puffs of smoke far below. Spitfire and Hurricane fighters, the heroes of the Battle of Britain, strained at the limits of their operational ceilings, their pilots beginning to suffocate from lack of oxygen, their canopies frosting over, their engines stalling in the thin air. They could only look up at this unreachable target with a feeling of impotent rage, and then it would unhurriedly, without aiming, drop a single bomb, just one. Not hundreds, like in carpet bombing raids, but one and it would disappear as silently as it had arrived. The physical damage from that single bomb was minuscule, a splinter in the giant construction site of the war. But the psychological blow, oh, that was something else entirely. It was a whisper in the dark that paralyzes more effectively than a scream. It was a constant, nagging sensation that you were being watched, that you were defenseless, that the enemy had an eye you could not gouge out, and a finger that could point down at you from the heavens at any moment. This was not a war of destruction. It was a war of attrition against the human spirit. And this ghostly battle was fought on the edge of space by an aircraft with the most peaceful of origins. The Junkers docu 86 p The High Altitude, Unattainable Ghost. Origins. A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. How the Reich's Wings Were Born. To understand the Junkers phenomenon, we must go back even further to the grim but hopeful 1930s. Germany, bound by the chains of the Treaty of Versailles, was like a predator in a cage. It was forbidden from having a full-fledged air force. But how can you stop the dream of flight? How can you forbid thinking, designing, engineering? The answer was brilliantly cunning. Civil aviation is our springboard, decided the strategist at the Ministry of Aviation of the Third Reich. Under Hermann Goering's leadership, a secret, large-scale program was launched to create dual-use aircraft. The idea was simple. Develop modern passenger airliners that, at a moment's notice, could be converted into bombers or reconnaissance planes within hours. It was in this shady niche between peace and war that the Junkers W-86 was born. In 1934, the airline Lufthansa, the aerial showcase of Nazi Germany, together with the military, formulated the technical requirements. A fast, twin-engine, economical aircraft capable of carrying 10 passengers in comfort, or half a ton of bombs in its fuselage. Economic Briefing the Nazi air renaissance. Have you ever wondered where a defeated, bankrupt Germany of the Great Depression found the money for such advanced projects? It's simple. They printed it. Literally. After Hitler came to power, the famous financier Schalmar Schacht launched a clever scheme to finance rearmament through so-called MIFO bills. These were promissory notes that the government issued to conglomerates like Junkers and Messerschmitt for delivered military goods. These bills were accepted by the Reichsbank and created the illusion of an economic boom. Essentially, it was a giant financial pyramid scheme designed to work until the war would start bringing in real trophies and resources. Every aircraft, including the Ju-86, was not just a machine, but a brick in this pyramid, a flying debt obligation. The first prototype flight took place on November 4, 1934. The Junkers Design Bureau, led by Ernst Zindel, presented an all-metal monoplane, the embodiment of modernity. It was an elegant aircraft with smooth duralumin skin. A small detail? Not at all. For Junkers, this was a revolution. Imagine all the firm's previous aircraft, like the famous Ju-52, were covered in characteristic corrugated metal, like a washboard. It was cheap and cheerful, but created monstrous aerodynamic drag. The Jiu-86 was smooth, streamlined, fast. It was beautiful. But here, too, the devil was in the details. The engines. 
Instead of conventional gasoline engines, the Ju-86 was fitted with diesel Jumo 205C engines. Why? Economics, my friend. Diesel engines were incredibly fuel efficient. They ate less fuel, giving it a huge range, the dream of any reconnaissance plane or bomber. But there's always a trade-off. These engines were heavy, capricious, reluctant to gain revs, and prone to overheating. It was a compromise. Sacrificing reliability and power for range. A compromise that would haunt the aircraft throughout its life. In February 1936, the military received their first Ju-86A1 bombers, and Lufthansa proudly presented the passenger Ju-86BU to its customers. But the plane's peaceful career didn't take off. Passengers complained about cramped conditions and the noise of the diesel engines, while competitors like the Heinkel He-111 offered greater comfort. The civilian mask began to slip, revealing its true military face. Priorities shifted decisively. Design. Anatomy of a ghost. Where was its secret hidden? Let's mentally disassemble this steel crane. The Jot U-86 is a medium bomber. Its crew consists of four men. Pilot, navigator, also the bombardier, radio operator, and gunner. A bit cramped, but functional. Its fuselage is oval in cross-section, built using the advanced for its time semi-monocoque technique. Imagine not a frame covered with fabric, but a rigid shell, like an egg, where the skin itself bears the main load strong and light. The wing, long, trapezoidal, cantilever. It allowed it to soar in the thin air like a glider. The landing gear was retractable, which was still a novelty in the mid-30s. And the tail, the tail was special. A twin tail, two small vertical stabilizers on the sides instead of one large one. This design improved handling at high speeds and reduced vibration. The aircraft was a stable platform for photography. Armament in the early versions was modest. Three 792 millimeter machine guns, one in the nose turret, one in the radio operator's cabin, and one in a retractable ventral turret for protection from below. The bomb load was up to 1,000 kilograms. Nothing outstanding. But the main problem with the ordinary Joe ED6 was its nasty longitudinal stability. It was as temperamental as an unbroken stallion. During landing, the slightest pilot error, and the plane could slam into the ground, folding a wing. It was nicknamed the Widowmaker. The problem was partially addressed in the Ju-86G modification, with a fully glazed nose and the cockpit moved forward. It got better, but its reputation was already cemented. And now we approach the main transformation, the one that turned it into a ghost. The P modification. Peak. Junkers engineers realized, to become invulnerable, you must go up, to where there are no anti-aircraft guns or fighters. But how? The thin air, the terrible cold of up to minus 60 degrees Celsius the lack of oxygen. The answer was a pressurized cabin, not a fully pressurized aircraft. No, that was too complex a task. They created a pressurized bathtub only for the two main crew members, the pilot and the navigator. Imagine an armored capsule built into the fuselage, thick glass on the portholes, rubber seals, a system pressurized by air from special compressors. It was their own little spaceship inside a conventional aircraft. The engines were also transformed. They were fitted with new diesel Jumo 207 engines, equipped with turbochargers, devices that forced air into the engines, preventing them from suffocating at altitude. They increased the wingspan from 25 to 32 meters, so the wing could bite into the thin air, and it flew. In February 1940, the Ju-86P prototype easily crossed the 12,000-meter threshold. The ghost was born. Combat use. A game of cat and mouse on the edge of space. The game began the summer of 1940. Britain is fighting. The Battle of Britain is at its peak. And above it all, with absolute impunity, the silver shadows of the Ju-86P begin to cruise. Scene 1. London in the crosshairs. It floats over the capital of the empire. Below, tiny toy houses, ribbons of streets, the twists of the River Thames. The pilot in his pressurized cocoon feels like a god. He is untouchable. His mission? Photo reconnaissance. Click, click. Cameras with meter-long lenses capture every runway, every factory, every anti-aircraft battery. Later, bombs would appear. Just one. 250 kilograms. It was dropped almost randomly, demonstratively. The goal was not to destroy, but to demonstrate. We are here. We can do anything. You can do nothing about it. The psychological effect was colossal. Imagine the morale of the OA crews who knew an enemy plane was hovering over their heads for hours, and they were powerless. It undermined faith in their own defenses, in technology, 
in the outcome of the war. But no fortress remains impregnable forever. The British are a stubborn and inventive people. The hunt began. Scene 2. The Ghostbusters. The first hunter was the Spitfire Mark Fakes team. It was specially lightened. Armor and some weapons were removed. Its wingspan was increased. A pressurized cabin was installed. But even it struggled to reach 13 kilometers. And then, in September 1942, a historic moment occurred. Flight Lieutenant Emmanuel Galitzin. Yes, a representative of the famous Princely family, fighting for Britain, in his modified Spitfire finds the Junkers. An incredible climb. A struggle with cold and oxygen starvation. And he attacks. Machine guns rattle against the seemingly inert target. Galitzin sees hits on the wing, but he fails to shoot it down. The ghost, though damaged, escapes. But the dam had been breached. In August of the same year, over Cairo, another lightened Spitfire finally shoots down a Jew 86P. The myth of invulnerability was shattered. The Germans, in panic, try to arm their high altitude planes with a retractable machine gun gondola. But this only worsens flight performance. By August 1943, the ghost's career in the West was over. Scene 3 The Eastern Front, The Eye of Barbarossa. But if in the West it was a psychological duel, in the East, the Jiu 86P committed its most terrible deeds. It became the main eye of Operation Barbarossa. From airfields in Hungary and Poland, four squadrons of these aircraft conducted total photo reconnaissance of the entire western part of the Soviet Union from the spring of 1941. They photographed everything. Airfields with planes lined up in neat rows, many of which would be destroyed on the very first day of the war. Troop dispositions, fortified areas, headquarters, fuel depots, analysis, and opinion. The price of blindness. Let's think for a second. Why was the USSR, with its giant air force, completely helpless against this aircraft? The answer is a tragic lag in key technologies. There was no radar tracking. The plane was detected by sound when it was already over the target. There were no high altitude fighters. Attempts to create them based on the Yak 9 or La 5 failed. The planes either lost controllability at altitude or their engines couldn't handle it. There was no oxygen equipment for pilots capable of operating at such altitude for extended periods. Most importantly, there was no understanding of the threat. The Red Army Air Force Command considered high-altitude flights impractical and unnecessary. This was a fatal strategic error. The data collected by the Ju 86P over Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states ended up on German generals' desks in the form of highly detailed maps. They knew almost everything about our army. This does not justify the disaster of 41, but it explains its monstrous scale. The Germans were not striking blindly. They were striking with precision. And it was this high-altitude reconnaissance plane that aimed them. Even over Moscow in 41 and 42, it felt like the master. Soviet air defenses were blind and powerless. The USSR never managed to create an adequate response to the Junkers until the very end of its career. Its flights over the Soviet Union ceased only when the front line moved so far west that it physically lost its forward airfields. Specifications export, and international use. A global shadow. A total of 822 aircraft of all modifications were built, and it spread across the world like a true ghost, appearing in the most unexpected places. South Africa. 18 machines converted from passenger airliners of the local airline. The irony of fate. They fought. Against the Italians in East Africa, that is, against a member of the Axis, Germany's ally, Hungary. 66 Ju 86K2 bombers. They fought on the Eastern Front and suffered horrific losses from Soviet fighters, as these were not high altitude versions. By 1942, almost none remained. Sweden. The country, maintaining neutrality, nevertheless purchased a license and produced the aircraft under the designation B 3. They used them as both bombers and torpedo bombers, guarding their coastline. Chile, Portugal, Bolivia, even Manchukuo. This aircraft left its mark everywhere. Technical characteristics of the Ju 86R1, the pinnacle of the ghost's evolution. Length, 16.5 meters. Wingspan, 32 meters. A huge wing. Empty weight, 6,785 kilograms. Maximum takeoff weight, 11,540 kilograms. Engines, two diesel Jumo 207B3 engines, 1,000 horsepower each. Service ceiling. 14,400 meters. That's almost 14 and a half kilometers. Maximum speed, 420 kilometers per hour at an altitude of 9,000 meters. Bomb load, 
either four 250 kilogram bombs or 16 50 kilogram bombs. Range up to 1,735 kilometers. Flight endurance seven hours, 10 minutes. Numbers that still command respect today. The last triumph and the demise of a concept. The Junkers Docu 86 was not a super weapon capable of turning the tide of the war. It was not a wonder waffy. Its combat tally is negligible by the standards of that slaughter, but its influence was profound, strategic. It was the last aircraft that could operate with almost 100% impunity. It was the last embodiment of the old, timeless dream of aviation. The unreachable bomber that could strike with impunity. It proved that war is not only about shells and tanks, but also about information, psychology, and technological superiority. But its era was short. Any point in the atmosphere and stratosphere soon ceased to be safe. New fighters appeared, not merely modified, but designed from the outset for high altitudes. New electronic equipment appeared. The arms race, which the Junkers had momentarily won, continued with renewed vigor, and it itself became its victim. German industry switched to mass-produced, versatile, and powerful machines. The Ju-88, He-177. The Jet Mi-262 was already on the horizon. The specialized high-altitude ghost was no longer needed. It faded into the shadows of history, leaving behind a legend of a silver shadow that, for several long years, was the king of the skies, unattainable and all-seeing. It reminds us of a simple but terrible truth. In war, the victor is not the one with more guns, but the one who is one step ahead in thought, in technology, in the willingness to look beyond the horizon even if that horizon is at an altitude of 14 kilometers. And so, our story of the celestial ghost comes to an end. I hope it made you think about those unknown pages of the war that remain in the shadows. If you found it as fascinating as I did while writing this text, support the channel with a like and a subscription. That's the best thanks an author can get. And right now, I'm waiting for each and every one of you in the comments. Tell me what you think. Could our air defenses have countered this plane? Or was the technological gap fatal? What other military secrets interest you? Let's discuss. Your engagement helps the channel grow and uncover new mysteries. Thanks for being with us.